a typical dry forest of Madagascar. Most of the plants here don't exist anywhere else in the world. They've evolved over millennia to cope with Western Madagascar's warm and arid climate, where the rainfall could be as little as 10 centimeters a year. But in fact, we're not in Madagascar. We're in a greenhouse in Lyon, France. Outside, it's cold, but in here, it's warm and dry. The plants thrive in Lyon's winter because the building allows sunlight in, warming the air. This warm air is trapped by the glass instead of escaping into the atmosphere. Greenhouses have been used by horticulturists and gardeners for centuries. But if you think that this is the greenhouse effect that scientists say is changing our climate, you'd be wrong, because global warming works in an entirely different way. Sunlight warms the Earth's surface, and in turn, the Earth's surface emits infrared radiation. Some of that infrared radiation is absorbed by the atmosphere, resulting in warming. But we are changing the composition of the atmosphere with greenhouse gases like CO2, which absorb much more infrared radiation and then emit it as heat. The spectre of man-made and rapid climate change is now real, researchers say. So what are we going to do about it? The Climate Change Conference in Copenhagen was billed as the largest and most important ever. But it wasn't just an international negotiation, it was a market where dozens of companies came to sell their solutions to reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Spotting a business opportunity is a very human trait, and many are seeing the mitigation of climate change as a big one. One sector that's expected to grow exponentially is carbon capture and storage. Carbon capture and storage has been applied in, in essence for 40 years by injecting CO2 into uh, oil reservoirs in Texas. But essentially there are four major projects in the world that have been created purely for the purpose of storing CO2. Uh, one is in the centre of the North Sea. This is the long, longest, uh, the oldest project which, which has been operating for 13 years and has been injecting a million tonnes a year into a, in, into a saline f formation. The International Energy Agency has, uh, has published a report uh, suggesting that we, that we need 3,400 projects by, by 2050 in place and that will save 20% uh, of, of total greenhouse gas emissions by that time. Solar energy is also expected to make a big contribution by partly replacing fossil fuel generated energy. We are convinced that um, photovoltaic is really a, a key part of, of the global solution uh, to the uh, increasing energy demand. It is one of the only renewable that can integrate seamlessly in a dense urban environment. And this is important when you know that um, more than 50% of the world population is living in cities, and cities are the main contributors to greenhouse gas emissions. We believe that by 2020, PV will become competitive for 55 to 75 percent of the electricity market in Europe. It will be hugely competitive by the next decade, but what is needed to get there is a strong commitment from the policy makers to support this uh, technology during this pre-competitive phase. Jeremy Leggett is a former geologist, green spokesperson, and now an entrepreneur. He believes a green revolution driven by business is waiting to happen. How do governments encourage entrepreneurs to actually be more entrepreneurial? Really, there's an inevitability about what we call the clean tech revolution. There are 50 families of energy efficient and renewable energy technology that excites investors right now. And there is going to be a revolution. We're on the inflection point of that already. The question is, can it come fast enough to deal with global warming? That's where the governments come in. If they really lead, if they can put in place policies to match their rhetoric on this subject, most of them, then we in the business world can deliver the changes that are necessary. Most of the entrepreneurs who came to Copenhagen acknowledged that their own drive to innovate must be matched by government's own desire to change and to offer support. We met Nabil Tanaka, head of the prestigious and influential International Energy Agency at his hotel after a hard day of negotiation. Is climate change a business opportunity? 
Certainly it is. It is a huge change. We, uh, simply, when we calculate the necessary private investment, which should happen, in addition to the business as usual uh, scenario, it, from now to 2030, it is 10 trillion US dollars. It's a huge pot potential uh, business opportunities. It, those should change the paradigm in terms of product design or business models, or those governments who change its uh, energy policy or climate change policy will win. What should governments do, do you think, to encourage investment in the private sector? Government can set the minimum efficiency standard for automobiles, fuel standards, or buildings, uh, this insulation standard, or minimum st efficiency standard for appliances, the government can set the ground. Of course, this must be well harmonized globally, otherwise there is some competition problems of course. This is a huge ask, isn't it? Remodeling society in just 40 years. Are we going to be able to do this? It's really challenging. Huge investment is necessary. But at the same time, when we discuss, this is not only climate change mitigation, but by using less energy or fossil fuel, it, it increases dramatically the energy security of consuming countries. And, and we are very successfully convinced that energy ministers, that this is a direction that ministers should take mm -hmm. toward the lower carbon economy or lower dependency to the fossil fuel. And majority of the ministers agree that we have to move that direction. So yes, as you say, it is very difficult, but it's possible. The Copenhagen Climate Change Conference may not have delivered the result that many were hoping for, but it did show that a revolution was waiting in the wings. That engine of change, human enterprise, is ready to deliver.